Chapter Eight, Part Two of Constance Dunlap by Arthur B. Reeve. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The abductors continued. The Gibbons, she found, lived in a large house on one of the numerous side streets from the park, in a neighborhood that was, in fact, something more than merely well-to-do. Fortunately, she found Everett Gibbons in and was ushered into his study, where he sat poring over some papers and enjoying an after-dinner cigar. "'Mr. Gibbons,' began Constance, "'I believe there is a one thousand dollar reward for news of the whereabouts of your daughter, Florence.' "'Yes,' he said in a colorless tone that betrayed the hopelessness of the long search. "'But we have traced down so many false clues that we have given up hope. Since the day she went away, we have never been able to get the slightest trace of her. Still, we welcome outside aid.' "'Of detectives?' she asked. "'Official and private. Paid and volunteer. Anybody.' he answered. I myself have come to the belief that she is dead, for that is the only explanation I can think of for her long silence. She is not dead, replied Constance in a low tone. Not dead, he repeated eagerly, catching at even such a straw as an unknown woman might cast out. Then you know? No, she interrupted positively. I cannot tell you any more. You must call off all other searchers. I will let you know. When? Tomorrow, perhaps the next day. I will call you on the telephone. She rose and made a hasty adieu before the man who had been prematurely aged might overwhelm her with questions and break down her resolution to carry the thing through as she had seen best. Cheerily, Constance turned the key in the lock of her door. There was no light, and somehow the silence smote on her ominously. Florence, she called. There was no answer. Not a sign indicated her presence. There was the divan with the pillows disarranged as they had been when she left. The furniture was in the same position as before. Hastily she went from one room to another. Florence had disappeared. She went to the door again. All seemed right there. If anyone had entered, it must have been because he was admitted, for there were no marks to indicate that the lock had been forced. She called up the tea room. Mrs. Palmer was very sympathetic, but there had been no trace of Viola Cole there yet. "'You will let me know if you get any word?' asked Constance anxiously. "'Surely,' came back Mrs. Palmer's cordial reply. A hundred dire possibilities crowded through her mind. Might Florence be held somewhere as a white slave, not by physical force, but by circumstances, ignorant of her rights, afraid to break away again? Or was it suicide, as she had threatened? She could not believe it. Nothing could have happened in such a short time to change her resolution about revenge.' The recollection of all the stories she had read recently crossed her mind. Could it be a case of drugs? The girl had given no evidence of being a dope fiend. Perhaps someone had entered after all. She thought of the so-called poisoned needle cases. Might she not have been spirited off in that way? Constance had doubted the stories. She knew that almost any doctor would say that it was impossible to inject a narcotic by a sudden jab of a hypodermic syringe. That was rather a slow, careful, and deliberate operation to be submitted to with patience. Yet Florence was gone. Suddenly it flashed over Constance that Drummond might not be seeking the reward primarily, after all. His first object might be shielding Preston. She recollected that Mr. Gibbons had said nothing about Drummond, either one way or the other. And if he were both shielding Preston and working for the reward, he would care little how much Florence suffered he might be playing both ends to serve himself. She rang the elevator bell. "'Has anybody called at my apartment while I was out?' she asked. "'Yes, um, a man came here.' "'And you let him up?' "'I didn't know you were out. You see, I had just come on. He said he was to meet someone at your apartment, and when he pressed the buzzer, the door opened, and I ran the elevator down again. I thought it was all right, ma'am.' "'And then what?' inquired Constance breathlessly. "'Well, in about five minutes, my bell rang.' I ran the elevator up again, and waiting was this man, with a girl I had never seen before. You understand, I thought it was all right. He told me he was going to meet someone. Yes, yes, I understand. Oh, my God, if I had only thought to leave word not to let her go. How did she look? Her clothes, you mean, ma'am? No, her face, her eyes. Begging your pardon, I thought she was, well, er, acted queer, scared, dazed-like. You didn't notice which way they went, I suppose? No, ma'am. I didn't. Constance turned back again into her empty apartment, heartsick. 
In spite of all she had planned and done, she was defeated, worse than defeated. Where was Florence? What might not happen to her? She could have sat down and cried. Instead, she passed a feverishly restless night. All the next day passed, and still not a word. She felt her own helplessness. She could not appeal to the police. That might defeat the very end she sought. She was single-handed. For all she knew, she was fighting the almost limitless power of brains and money of Preston. Inquiry developed the fact that Preston himself was reported to be in Chicago with his fiancée. Time and again she was on the point of making the journey to let him know that someone, at least, was watching him. But, she reflected, if she did that she might miss the one call from Florence for help. Then she thought bitterly of the false hope she had raised in the despairing father of Florence Gibbons. It was maddening. Several times during the day Constance dropped into the Betsy Ross without finding any word. Late that night the buzzer on her door sounded. It was Mrs. Palmer herself, with a letter at last, written on rough paper in pencil with a trembling hand. Constance almost literally pounced on it. Will you tell the lady who was so kind to me that while she was out seeing you at the tea-room there was a call at her door? I didn't like to open it, but when I asked who was there, a man said it was the steam-fitter she had asked to call about the heat. I opened the door. From that moment when I saw his face until I came to myself here, I remember nothing. I would write to her, only I don't know where she lives. One of the bell-boys here is kind enough to smuggle this note out for me. Address to the Betsy Ross. Tell her, please, that I am at a place in Brooklyn, I think called Lustgartens. She can recognize it, because it is at a railroad crossing. Steam railroads, not trolleys or elevateds. I know you think me crazy, Mrs. Palmer, but the other lady can tell you about it. Oh, it was the same horrible feeling that came over me that night as before. It isn't a dream. It's more like a trance. It comes in a second, usually when I am frightened. I suddenly feel nervous and shaky. I can't tell what is going on around me. I lose my hearing. Part of the time it is as though I had a paralytic stroke of the tongue. The next day, perhaps, it is gone. But while it lasts, it is terrifying. It is like walking into a new world, with everybody, everything strange about me. The note ended with a most pathetic appeal. Constance was already nervously putting on her hat. You are going to go there? asked Mrs. Palmer. "'If I can locate the place,' she answered. "'Aren't you afraid?' inquired the other. Constance did not reply. She ostentatiously slipped a little ivory-handled revolver into her handbag. "'It's a new one,' she explained finally. "'Like nothing you've ever heard of before, I guess. I bought it only the other day after a friend of mine told me about it.' Mrs. Palmer was watching her closely. "'You—you you are a good woman,' she burst out finally. "'It isn't good business. It isn't good sense.' Constance stopped short in her preparations for the search. What are business and sense compared to the the life of— She checked herself on the very point of revealing the girl's real name. Nothing, replied Mrs. Palmer. I had already made up my mind to go with you before I spoke, if you will let me. In a moment the two understood each other better than after years of casual acquaintance. Back and forth through the mazes of streets and car lines of the city across the river the two women traveled asking veiled questions of every wearer of a uniform, until at last they found such a place as Florence had described in her note. There, it seemed, had sprung up a little center of vice. While reformers were trying to clamp down tight the lid in New York, all the vicious elements were prying it up here. Crushed in one place, they rose again in another. There was the electric sign, Lusgarten. Even a cursory glance told them that it included a saloon on the first floor with a sort of dance hall and second-rate cabaret. Above that was a hotel. The windows were darkened, with awnings pulled down, even on what must have been in the daytime the shady side. "'Shall we go in? Are you game?' asked Constance of her companion. "'I haven't gone so far without considering that,' replied Mrs. Palmer, somewhat reproachfully. Without a word, Constance entered the door down the street, followed by her companion. A negro at the little cubby hole of an office pushed out a register at them. Constance signed the first names that came into her head, and a moment later they were on their way up to a big double room on the third floor, led by another, younger negro. 
"'Will you send the bellboy up?' asked Constance as they entered the room. "'I'm the bellboy, ma'am,' was his disconcerting reply. "'I meant the other one,' replied Constance, hazarding. "'The one who is here in the daytime.' "'There ain't no other boy, ma'am. There ain't no—' "'Could you deliver a note for me at a tea-room in New York tomorrow?' interrupted Constance, striking while the iron seemed hot. The boy turned around abruptly from his busy occupation of doing something useless that would elicit a tip. He quietly shut the door and wheeled about with his hand still on the knob. "'Do you want to know what room she's in?' he asked. Constance opened her handbag. Mrs. Palmer suppressed a little scream. She had expected that ivory-handled thing to appear. Instead, there was a treasury note of a size that caused the white part of the boy's eyes to expand beyond all the laws of optics. Yes, she said, pressing it into his hand. Forty-two, down the hall, around the turn, on the other side, whispered the boy. And for God's sake, ma'am, don't tell nobody I told you. His shuffle down the hall had scarcely ceased before the two women were stealthily creeping in the opposite direction, looking eagerly at the numbers. Constance had stopped abruptly around the turn. Through a transom of one of the rooms, they could hear voices, but could see no light. "'Well, go back, then,' growled a gruff voice. "'Your family will never believe your story. Never believe that you came again and stayed at Luff's Gartens against your will. Why,' the voice taunted with a harsh laugh, "'if they knew the truth, they would turn you from the door, instead of offering a reward.' There was a moment of silence. Then a woman's voice, strangely familiar to Constance, spoke. "'The truth!' she exclaimed bitterly. "'He knew it was a case of a girl who liked a good time, liked pretty clothes, a ride in an automobile, theaters, excitement, bright lights, night life, a girl with a romantic disposition in whom all that was repressed at home.' "'He knew it!' she replied, raising the tone to an almost hysterical pitch. "'Led me on, made me love him because he could give them all to me. And when I began to show the strain of the pace, they all show it more than the men, he cast me aside like a squeezed-out lemon. As she listened, Constance understood it all now. It was to make Florence Gibbons a piece of property, a thing to be traded in, bartered. That was the idea. Discover her, yes, but first to thrust her into the life if she would not go into it herself. Anything to discredit her testimony beforehand, anything to save the precious reputation of one man. Well, shouted the other voice menacingly, do you want to know the truth? Haven't you read it often enough? Instead of hoping you will return, they pray that you are dead. He hissed the words out, then added, they prefer to think that you are dead. Why, damn it, they turn to that belief for comfort. Constance had seized Mrs. Palmer by the arm, and acting in concert, they threw both their weights against the thin wooden door. It yielded with a crash. Inside, the room was dark. Indistinctly, Constance could make out two figures, one standing, the other seated in a deep rocker. A suppressed exclamation of surprise was followed by a hasty lunge of the standing figure toward her. Constance reached quickly into her handbag and drew out the little ivory-handled pistol. Bang! It spat almost into the man's face. Choking, sputtering, the man groped a minute blindly, then fell on the floor and frantically tried to rise again and call out. The words seemed to stick in his throat. "'You—you you shot him?' gasped a woman's voice, which Constance now knew was Florence's. "'With the new German Secret Service gun,' answered Constance quietly, keeping it level to cow any assistance that might be brought. "'It blinds and stupefies without killing, a bulletless revolver intended to check and render harmless the criminal instead of maiming him. The cartridges contain several chemicals that combine when they are exploded and form a vapor which blinds a man and puts him out. No one wants to kill such a person as this. She reached over and switched on the lights. The man on the floor was Drummond himself. You will tell your real employer, Mr. Preston, she added contemptuously, that unless he agrees to our story of his elopement with Florence, marries her, and allows her to start an undefended action for divorce, we intend to make use of the new Federal Man Act, with a jail sentence for both of you. Drummond looked up sullenly, still blinking and choking. "'And not a word of this until the suit is filed. Then we will see the reporters, not he. Understand?' "'Yes,' he muttered, still clutching his throat. An hour later Constance was at the telephone in her own apartment. "'Mr. Gibbons, I must apologize for troubling you at this late or rather early hour.' 
but I promised you something which I could not fulfill until now. This is the Mrs. Dunlap who called on you the other day with a clue to your daughter, Florence. I have found her, yes, working as a waitress in the Betsy Ross tea room. No, not a word to anyone, not even to her mother. No, not a word. You can see her tomorrow at my apartment. She is going to live with me for a few days until, well, until we can get a few little matters straightened out. Constance had jammed the receiver back on the hook hastily. Florence Gibbons, wild-eyed, trembling, imploring, had flung her arms about her neck. No, 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 she cried. I can't. I won't. With a force that was almost masculine, Constance took the girl by both shoulders. The one thousand dollar reward, which comes to me, said Constance decisively, will help us straighten out those few little matters with Preston. Mrs. Palmer can stretch the time which you have worked for her. Something of Constance's will seemed to be infused into Florence Gibbons by force of suggestion. And remember, said Constance in a tense voice, for anything after your elopement, it's aphasia, aphasia, aphasia. End of chapter 8